Servius Tullius never should have been king. Born a slave, he made his way up the societal ranking through his own personal prowess and the superstition of the wife of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Tanaquil. However, Servius proved himself to be a good Roman king. His political reforms would guide the Roman state even past the end of the monarchy and into the early and middle republic. Servius proved himself on the battlefield by defeating the Etruscans in several wars and engagements. All in all, Servius was certainly cut out to be a Roman king, and yet, even after proving himself, he was never quite able to shake the label of being slave-born, and in the end, it would be his downfall. Before we get any further into today's episode, I just want to quickly ask that you subscribe and like if you enjoy my content. It really helps the channel out and it motivates me to make more content. Also, follow me on Twitter to get updates about any videos in progress. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. As has become normal for this series, I want to quickly note here that we should take much of these stories with a bit of skepticism. Many of the deeds and even the people themselves in the histories of this period may have not been real or may not have happened in the way we are told they did. Just keep that in mind as we talk about Servius. Servius' birth is shrouded in myth and legend. Most of our sources agree that his mother was Orchrissa, a noblewoman from the city of Cornicellum. Orchrissa was captured during the Roman siege and eventual conquest of the city and taken back to Rome as a slave. Some sources say that she was already pregnant at this point, while others say that she was a virgin. Orchrissa was treated rather respectably for a slave due to her birth status and, depending on who you choose to believe, was either married to a close associate of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Rome's fifth king, or became a Vestal Virgin. In the version of our myth where she is depicted as a Vestal Virgin, it is said that one day, after offering the ritual sacrifices at the hearth, Acrissa was penetrated by a disembodied phallus that rose from the hearth. That sounds like a pretty good time. In this version, Tanaquil believes this to be a divine manifestation, and after Servius was born from this episode, she believes him to have been divinely fathered. This is a myth as old as Roman history itself. Nearly every single famous Roman has some sort of myth attached to them that depicts them as a son of some sort of god or other divine entity. We need only look back to Romulus to find an example. Remember, he was said to be the son of Mars, who impregnated his mother, who actually also happened to be a Vestal Virgin. If you want to hear more of that story, check out the video in the top right. The much more believable story of Servius' birth would make him the son of Orchrissa and a trusted client and advisor of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. I'm sure I don't need to tell you which version I subscribe to. The myth of being divinely born is just an easy way for anyone to gain some sort of importance in Roman history. Anyway, Servius, from his birth, was favored by Tanaquil, who firmly believed that much like her husband, Servius was destined for greatness. This would only be reinforced when in his early childhood, some members of the royal household would see a nimbus, or an aura, of fire above his head. In Rome, this was considered a sign of divine favor, and a sign of great potential. Servius, being born to a slave of the royal household, was made a part of the extended familia of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. It would seem that Lucius took Servius under his wing, and Servius became a sort of protege to the king. The king and Servius were so close that Lucius allowed him to marry his daughter, Tarquinia. This seems kind of strange for us to think about. How could a son of a slave marry the daughter of a king? In truth, it is kind of strange. However, the key here is likely Tanaquil's belief in the boy. While it is true that Orchrissa would have been awarded a special sort of status due to her being a noblewoman, it still would likely not have been enough to get her son married to the daughter of a king. Instead, it was likely Tanaquil's, frankly, obsession with Servius. I don't know if this was because Tanaquil truly believed that Servius was destined for greatness, or for some other reason. But whatever the case, it is undeniable that Tanaquil greatly favored the boy. In fact, she would be the entire reason that Servius was even in the position to become king. If you've seen the last episode, and if you haven't, check the upper right hand corner, I would definitely recommend watching at least the last couple minutes of that episode. You would remember that Lucius was the victim of an assassination plot of the sons of the previous king, Ansus Marcius. We are told that Lucius received some sort of blow to the head. It is unclear if this blow immediately killed the king, or if he managed to survive for a time. But in any case, 
Tanaquil reacted quickly, taking the king, or perhaps his dead body, back to the royal palace and placing it under lockdown. No one was allowed in nor out. We can assume that at some point a crowd had gathered outside the palace, searching for news on the status of their king, as we are told that Tanaquil announced from a palace window that Lucius lived and had named Servius as his regent, while he recovered. It is unclear just how true this is. Even if Lucius was alive, it is very possible, and possibly even likely, that the blow to the head would have seriously inhibited his ability to communicate. On the other hand, it does seem like Lucius at least favored Servius enough to marry him to his daughter. So is it possible that Lucius did actually name Servius as his regent? Sure. Is it likely? Probably not. Instead, it's very likely that this was all done by Tanaquil, with or without the help of Servius himself. Shortly afterward, the death of Lucius was confirmed, and the Senate, and only the Senate, elected Servius as king. This would mark the first time that the Roman king would be elected without the consent of the people of Rome. This whole episode has always seemed very strange to me. First of all, what in the world was Tanaquil doing? She and Lucius had sons of their own. Why was this son of a slave so important to her? If we are to believe the myths, then it was likely purely because of the divine signs of favoritism that Servius received. This would actually line up pretty well with both the characteristics of Tanaquil and her husband, who were both very superstitious. But I think there is something deeper here. Personally, I wonder if Servius was somehow successful in gathering support in the Senate for his election, either upon the death of Lucius or even before. This would be with or without the help of Tanaquil. This would help explain why the people were ignored in the election of Servius. Perhaps he felt he could only convince the Senate. Remember that there were still two sons of Lucius kicking around, and two sons of Ancius as well. Perhaps the Roman people were in favor of one of them and so the Senate was forced to simply ignore them. Of course, this is all my own speculation, and I'm likely completely wrong. In any case, I just think there is much more to this story than what we are being told. Regardless of my ramblings about ancient conspiracies, Servius was elected king in 578 BCE. We are told that early in his reign he would declare war upon Ve and other Etruscan cities. Quite literally, the only things we are told about these campaigns are that Servius showed great valor during the war, that he routed a large enemy army, and that his victory over the Etruscans helped solidify his position as king. Very, very descriptive. You've got to love historians writing about events that happened five centuries prior to their writing. Note the very heavy sarcasm there. If we go back to the Fasti Triumphalus, we see that Servius celebrated three triumphs over the Etruscans, one on the 25th of November, 571 BCE, and one on the 25th of May, 567 BCE, with the date of the last triumph being illegible. That is the sum total of information we have on the wars during Servius's reign. Instead, Livy and the other Roman historians prefer to focus on his crowning political achievement, the Servian Constitution, or the Servian Reforms. Before we get too deep into talking about these reforms, we should note that it is literally impossible that everything attributed to Servius here was actually done by the man himself. Instead, the Servian constitution represented a long-drawn, complex, and piecemeal process of populist policy and reform that extended from Servius, and perhaps even his predecessors, to his successor, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, and even into the Republic. So while I'm going to tell you about everything that Livia attributes to Servius, take this all with a grain of salt and remember that while Servius did certainly have a hand in starting the process of reforming, some, and perhaps even most of these reforms and measures, happened far after Servius's reign. The Servian reforms are mostly based around granting voting rights to various different groups. Because fiscal and military responsibilities were tied to voting status throughout most of Roman history, these reforms inevitably affected nearly every aspect of Roman life. At the point of Servius's reign, the Senate had grown to some 300 members. Each member was appointed by their respective gens, or family. These families were patrician, and typically claimed descent from one of the legendary founding families or individuals of Rome. The problem here 
was that the Senate was an increasingly smaller and smaller minority of the Roman citizenry. This issue was compounded by the fact that the Commoda Curiae, which was the main gathering of Roman citizens that elected kings and served as Rome's main legislative body, only allowed those 300 or so patrician families to vote inside of citizen assemblies. This led to an increasingly smaller minority ruling over the majority of Roman citizens. The problem here should be fairly easy to see. It wouldn't take very long for some plebeian citizen to realize the imbalance in power, and that realization could lead to some very serious consequences for the fledgling Roman state. To combat this issue, Servius created the Comita Centuria, or the Centuriat Assembly. In this assembly, Rome's citizens were separated into classes, based on their status, wealth, and age. These classes were further divided into centuries, supposedly made up of 100 men, but in practice the number was much more variable. Each century held one vote. The classes were also divided by age, typically in half. These divisions were called the seniores, aged 46 to 60, and the unores, aged 17 to 46. This naturally led to more power being concentrated in the hands of older citizens. Here we start to see the crossover between Roman civil life and the Roman military. The centuries were divided into three different grades. The officer class, which was the cavalry or the equites, the enlisted class, which was the Roman infantry, and the miscellaneous class, mostly unarmed adjuncts. The officer class received 18 centuries, six of which were composed of purely patricians, while the enlisted class received 170 centuries, and the miscellaneous class received five. The divisions in the assembly not only reflected the civil divisions and privileges, but also the militaristic obligations of individuals. Servius created five groups for the enlisted class. The first group would have been Rome's richest citizens. This group would have had access to the best equipment for war. They would have had heavy armor and access to a spear and a sword. Each succeeding group would have had less wealth and less access to equipment. In fact, the fifth group of citizens likely had little more than slings and stones for equipment. Each of the five groups were divided equally between centuries of younger soldiers and centuries of older soldiers. The first group consisted of 80 centuries. Groups 2 through 4 consisted of 20 centuries each, and group 5 consisted of 30 centuries. A final five centuries were dedicated for the miscellaneous class. Typically, these were the poor and unlanded citizenry. Four of these five centuries were dedicated to artisans and musicians, while the last century was composed of the proletarii, those with very little to no property. In each vote, the centuries higher up in the order were required to vote first, before those below them were allowed to. This meant that the officer class would vote first, then the enlisted class, and then the miscellaneous class. Each group within those classes would vote based upon their wealth, with wealthier groups voting first. The six patrician groups inside the officer class were the first to vote. With measures only requiring a simple majority, the lower classes of citizens rarely, if ever, were allowed to vote. Typically only the officer class and the first group of the enlisted class would vote. This of course meant that in practice, much of the power in Rome remained concentrated in the upper echelons of society. This new system of classification meant that Rome now needed a way to figure out the wealth of its citizens. To do this, Servius instituted the first Roman census, technically making Servius the first Roman censor. To conduct this census, Roman citizens were told to gather in the Campus Martius, based on their tribe, which was the largest classification of families in Rome. The citizens were required to report their social rank, household, property, and income. This would establish their tax obligations, military obligations, and their assignment to their grouping in the Centuriat Assembly. All right, that was a lot. Hopefully that all made sense. If you have any questions, leave them down below, and I'll do my best to sort out any confusion. To further augment his new classification system, Servius also increased the number of tribes in Rome, along with expanding the city limits. Servius abolished the tribes created by Romulus, the Ramnus, the Titus, and the Luceres, and replaced them with the Suburniana, the Esquiliana, the Colina, and the Palantina tribes. 
these new tribes were based on where the individual citizen resided, rather than their ancestry. Thus, these tribes not only represented the largest unit of family in Rome, but also sections of the city itself. This brought many royal and urban plebeians who, while owning quite a bit of land and being rather wealthy, were unable to participate in politics prior to Servius into Roman political life. This division of Rome would last until the reign of Augustus, some 600 years later. Servius is also credited with at least issuing the first stamped currency in Rome. The ancient sources give him credit for being the first person to introduce coinage in Rome, but this is unlikely, as it seems that Rome did not adopt coinage until the Republican period. Instead, it is likely that Servius stamped raw bullion, as at this point the Roman economy was almost entirely agrarian, and so had little use for coinage. Servius is also credited with the construction of the Temple of Diana on the Aventine Hill, and the construction of a city spanning moat and wall parts of which are still standing today. Servius would eventually be murdered in 535 BCE by the son of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus and Rome's last king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. Livy states that Servius had two daughters, both of which would marry the sons of Lucius Priscus. Tullia the Elder would marry Arnus Tarquinius, while Tullia the Younger would marry Lucius Superbus. We are told that Tullia the Younger and Lucius Superbus arranged the murder of their respective siblings and began to plot against Servius. Lucius Superbus, on the urging of Tullia, would bribe or convince the Senate to support him against Servius. After gaining this support, Lucius Servius would give a speech before the Senate, where he criticized Servius for being a slave born of a slave, for failing to be elected by the Senate and the people during an interregnum, as had been the tradition for the election of kings of Rome, for being gifted to throne by a woman, for favoring the lower classes of Rome over the wealthy, and for taking the land of the upper classes for distribution to the poor, and for instituting the census, which exposed the wealthy upper classes to popular envy. When Servius showed up to defend himself, Lucius Superbus threw him down the Senate steps, where his men murdered him in the street. Livy writes that this would eventually be part of the justification behind the abolition of the Roman monarchy, and that Servius was the last benevolent Roman king. For a man who never should have become king, Servius did a pretty bang-up job. Not only did he successfully wage war against the Etruscans, but he gave the right to vote, at least on paper, to the entire growing class of Roman citizens. His reforms would last for centuries after his death, and his basis for the organization of the citizenry would last just as long. In truth, I think Servius really represents the first Roman leader who could be called a populist, a legacy that would eventually be passed to men like Caesar and Augustus, two of the greatest Romans of all time. And if you ask me, that's a pretty good legacy for someone who was born from the womb of a slave. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. I hope this section on the reforms of Servius were easy to follow. The organization of the Centuriae Assembly is hard to put together even for those of us who have no life and read about Rome all day. I hope I did a fair enough job of putting it together. If you have any comments or questions on the video or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. It really helps the channel out. Peace.